Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Kate Burt. Kate is the founder and CEO of Hive Risk, a boutique risk and compliance company. She is also the co-founder of Compliance for Law Firms. Kate has over 20 years of experience in the legal industry as a litigation fee earner at Hill Dickinson LLP, senior litigator at BLM and Keos, head of risk and compliance at Legal and head of risk and compliance at Vincent Solicitors. In 2017, Kate founded Hive Risk, advising law firms, award-winning reg tech, as well as legal service providers on market strategy, law firm insights, and regulatory compliance. So a very big warm welcome, Kate. Great to be here, Rob. Uh, It's a pleasure to have you on the Legally Speaking podcast. It's been a while, um, but we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very real, how would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? I have only seen thumbnails. Okay. I, I am not a fan. I haven't watched it. So just from the glamour of what I can see on the outside, I would say four. Four. Okay, fair enough. And with a four, we'll move swiftly on to talk all about you. So would you mind telling our listeners a bit about your background and career journey today? Yeah, absolutely. So from a, a very young age, I knew I was going to be a solicitor, a lawyer. In <laughs> fact, I can pinpoint it to the moment <laughs> where I was going to be a solicitor. So I was around 14 in a bedroom with my friend, school friend at the time. Ali McBeal was all the rage at the time. Yeah. And um, my friend had some university prospectuses on the bed. Um, and we were chatting about, oh, what shall we be when we grow up? And it was then, oh, we'll, we'll both be lawyers. Yeah. We'll both be lawyers. So from age 14, that was it. Just There was no real question about it at that point that was what we were going to do so um she actually became a teacher um, oh. so she didn't agree to the fact <laughs> she broke the contract <laughs> absolutely so but but ultimately i went a very very traditional route into law so a level law degree a um, um straight up to an llb at liverpool john Moores university into you your old you know your traditional training contract lpc route into um and, and basically qualified as a as a litigator because my seats at the time although they should have been uh, you know a, a perfect uh, sort of representation of, of of legal practice it was pretty much i was a litigator i was a personal injury fee and after all that time we got through it but essentially that's where i qualified into as a as a litigator because that's what i was going to ask you actually where from your training days and the firms you're at where did that interest in litigation come from other than ali McBeal. yeah <laughs> other than ali McBeal. yeah so it was just setting the scene a little bit into in the year 2000 that's when i was sort of uh, i was doing my um degree it was the litigation capital of the world in liverpool in the northwest of england oh, yeah. and all the opportunities were around litigation and so the interest came from from where the opportunities were but actually i i found that personally i really thrived on the legal research side of it the building arguments and and that really interested me on the litigation side and um, particularly the advocacy i've really sort of shone to and in the in the first week of my training contract at irvings um i was uh, tasked with doing the advocacy on a mock uh, cost hearing and they had all the solicitors all the, the partners in the boardroom I was to argue against one of the other solicitors and they got a, a district judge in to uh, well actually it was a barrister and he played the district judge and it was an hours fighting about <laughs> costs of, of following an RTA so right from the off I was in the thick of it and you had to know your case law you had to know your your arguments and that really really sort of it was challenging but I absolutely thrived in that sort of environment. Yeah, and I'm just having flashbacks in my head. You mentioned about sort of Liverpool being that litigation capital and sort of the power of geography, because a lot of people know who follow the show that my grandfather ran a law firm in the 1950s and he spearheaded that in Leicester, which at the time back then had a lot of the local commercial um, hosiery trade. So there's a lot of commercial business available. So he actually got to grow to be a successful law firm outside of any of the major London players due to that particular city. So it's interesting you again mentioned with litigation for you and how that was a good building block for your career Absolutely. and what you've got on to. So let's talk talk a bit more about your career. We're going to switch to compliance now. Um, obviously, we're going to come on to all the great things you're doing at the moment. But prior to that, you had to pick up some experience and you were head of risk and compliance at uh, the likes of Legal and Vincent Solicitors. So tell us a bit about some of the valuable skills you picked up in those roles. Um, so I'll start from why, why I even got into risk and compliance because I was yeah. a pure litigator for many years and yeah. sort of a very established career as a, as a litigator. But in um, around 2016, I knew I sort of had this entrepreneurial pull 
yep. to, and I, I, I knew that the, the traditional route wasn't working for me. And it was one of those, it's sort of, it happened, it wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah. So whilst I was working my notice period, um, I was asked to, at, at one of the big law firms I was working at, um, I was asked to help a, 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 law, um, a claims management company, company pursue an ABS. They okay. needed a solicitor to help with that application um, to be, become a law firm, essentially. And so I was like, yeah, I can help. Don't know what I'm doing. I'm a solicitor. Uh, kind of know about um, compliance, but not properly, because no one te taught it back then. It wasn't no. a, a recognized uh, profession in, in my world. Yep. And so it was doing that, that piece of work, that application for them. I was like, oh, this is a thing. Yeah. This is a thing. So I was self-taught from that point. So I... And it, around that time, um, the GDPR came out as well. So it was it was about to take effect May you know May 20, 2018. Um, so I I learned with my legal background and um, <clears throat> reading statute, I learned the GDPR. <laughs> if that's a, if that's yeah. a thing, and I just started going out and lecturing on it to small businesses, to um, you know, online on LinkedIn on. Facebook, I did a, a, on a, a Facebook Live to a group of small business owners on the impact of GDPR. So I actually learned compliance from scratch, essentially self-taught. And it was actually, um, I then went into to Legal Eye, which is a, a compliance firm, and learned how to do it properly. <laughs> Literally, I don't know if Paul Saunders is watching, he'll say, uh, yes, she's had a lot of learning to do at that point. But then I thought, like, oh, this is this is actually a thing. So um, I, at some point, went in-house at, at Vincent's, and that's where I really learned the cut and thrust of what risk and compliance is today. Yeah. Um, and obviously you picked up a lot of skills and you had that entrepreneurial bug inside you. So we come to 2017, high risk. Um, you know, I think it's super exciting what you're doing. You know, you and I are good friends off the show as well and do a lot of collaborations which we're gonna talk about. But let's talk to that why, why high risk and tell us exactly what you, you're getting up to and sure. how you help people. Sure, so it was, it's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have yeah. long enough today to all the ups and downs of it. But essentially, so, so you talk about 20, 2017, that's when I set up my limited company and it's called and it's still called today, Kate Burt Legal Limited. Nice. And I didn't actually brand high risk until 2021. Okay. So from 2017 to 2021, I was in all in different guises, in different ways, essentially a consultant, sole trader, um, essentially building my own personal practice. Yeah. Um, in 2021, I always knew I wanted to build a team around this. In 2021, um, I thought, right, now's the time, let's brand this. And Hive Risk came to me, I was um, sort of uh, brainstorming different things and just I've got a very creative mind so I'm constantly yeah. trying to think of different ideas and, and bringing things to life and I remember I was walking over to my mum's house over the hill over uh, over the uh, railway and Hive came to mind and I'd read on my bookshelf there's a book called um, Wisdom of the Bees right. and my mind went going down that that direction about the organizational um, principles of the bees uh, building a hive and, and it yeah. was really that and I could there were so many um, angles I could see that that could comply, uh, apply to compliance and risk management actually so I got the, the word hive there and then it was just different brains brainstorming and um, it ultimately evolved into hive risk um, which I think has just got such a powerful uh, and I'm very particular if anyone and we've had a chat about this before, <laughs> yeah. the, before the show if anyone calls it hive or abbreviates it it kind of hits my ear wrong and I'm like it's hive risk yeah. some people also say high risk as well or it comes yeah. on that yeah, on some titles on which that, like, on captions, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. but very much um it's it, I didn't know that it was going to become the strong brand that it is today when when it, but I just had a feeling about it this has got this is strong I love that. And it's, again, I always say to people, particularly thinking in the entrepreneurial world, like simple things can lead to an action. Like you're, you're on a walk and a thought came into your head. You know, a lot of people, you know, you may be sat at your desk, you get overwhelmed, like just getting up, moving. I know you're obviously on the, on the move anyway, but things come to you when you're actually more active, like an active body, your thoughts come in and if you can jot them down and really kind of ruminate on them and move forward. I love how you kind of came about that story on the busy bee side of things. And the well. number of letters I've written in the shower. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or even LinkedIn yeah. posts, you're yeah. thinking, ah, you know, a concept comes to you and you kind of work it all out through the, th- and, and, and while you're asleep as well. And yeah. you wake up with ideas as well. So really key to, to build this a bit, building this business and, and what we sort of infuse across the, all the staff as well is, is that real creative, creative side of what we do. And that's one of our core values is creative innovation. Um, so yeah, we just love it. And I think, you know, you've got, I love the colors as well and everything a part of it, it's good. But let's talk about who you, you help. So you help um, law firms, real estate businesses, legal tech, startups. So what types of services do you actually provide to these clients? Okay, so our bread and butter work, so that our, our the bulk of our sort of client base is law firms, sort of mid-market law firms. And they come to us in all different ways. There's so many different ways that we work with, with them. One of the key ways we work with them is on anti-money laundering, their response yeah. to, and increasingly so, because the regulator is really coming down on, <laughs> on, on firms. We've seen some of the headlines, you know, the, the Clyde & Co, half a million pound yeah. fine, and, and it's almost daily, it seems as though there's something in the headlines about anti-money laundering. So over the last three years, we've seen a massive uptick, take, uptick in, the, in the requirement for what we do, actually. Yeah. So in one of the ways we work with firms is, we are their full compliance team. So we are literally, our our emails um, um, are their firm's domain name, you know, to their staff, when they're interacting with our team, we are their firm. So, and and in that, when we work with firms in that way, we are literally everything that is their compliance team, from analyst, compliance analyst, all the way up to risk director, um, where we meet with managing departments, managing partners in sort of weekly board meetings and that sort of that whole breadth of, of the compliance team, which is I think really is our sort of differentiator in the market that we are we have that sort of at the coal face experience and that's why we understand our clients so well. Yeah, and I, I love that. And like I say, I don't see others really doing it to the to the level that you do it in the market. And that's why I've been so impressed by not only your growth, but kind of the quality of the services that you bring. So, but just getting people more educated that are obviously very strict on sort of knowing the lawyer, but I think the compliance side is so important because you provide, as I say, fully embedded compliant teams. So you've got counter fraud services, offshore and complex source of fund specialists. So for our listeners who might be less familiar with those types of terms, can you just tell us a little bit more about that yeah. and types of things you're going to get your hands on? Yeah. So if people might need your services <laughs> and also be interested in that from a career perspective. Yeah, so so often it, anything tricky that comes up with, with risk and compliance essentially, yeah. often it's, it's anti-money laundering, but it could be anything. So it could be a conflict of interest query or it could be a, you know, a regulatory breach actually. And we, for some, for, for some firms, we're that phone a friend. So anything sort of tricky comes up and, yep. and, and they'll, they'll, they'll give us a call. Um, on the tricky source of funds you mentioned, so it may be that we're not the, their compliance team, but there's something landed, there's a deal that needs to go through, often within 24 hours, like we need the, we need help steering the due diligence on this, we don't know where to start, it's got offshore, it's got an offshore element, there's high risk country involved, um, there's trust involved, we don't know where to start, so we say, calm, don't worry, yep. it's fine, we get, we get them all sort of set up and then we, our team very very experienced on that and we can kind of steer them through safely and it might be steering them through safely so they can proceed with the transaction or it might be whoa stop uh, this has got red flags over it you don't you know and we kind of help them through that process of not moving moving into dangerous waters on that yeah and i understand that and it's it's you know what the stuff that we're talking about is very important these aren't nice to have you know if you get this wrong it could be a, a lot of trouble one thing i've come to learn about you from working with you on projects is you're, you're a very strategic mind thinker mm-hmm. so you know you've got this 20 years plus of really good solid legal experience you know you really understand law firms you're obviously now following all your training everything you've done following your diy shall we say start to, to compliance so you know what adv- advising law firms what's sort of your way of bringing that sort of unique market strategy to them what are some of the top things you would say okay. um that would help them i think firstly is is it don't not being quick to jump jump to the answer, not being quick to jump to the judgment. So firstly, you've got to understand you, you the client. When I'm talking about the client, the law firm, so our client. So yeah. We understand their business, we understand their motivation, and to understand their their appetite for risk. Mm-hmm. That's really important because there's there's so many different ways you can approach it, and we take a consultative approach. So we understand we try and understand what the where the pain points are as well, and then once we've got that information and built up a really good picture, then we start to ask the questions. Then we start to give recommendations. 
from a compliance perspective, but also from a commercial perspective. Mm -hmm. So what's good for business actually, and what and also what actually, if you change things or if you take a certain approach, it might be actually more efficient for the business or you could win more business or you could so we have that broader view and particularly as, as a business owner yeah. <laughs> that's been actually one of the biggest teachers for me running a business and quite a, a high growth high risk <laughs> <laughs> business yeah. um, that actually I I see a lot of parallels with with my clients particularly with the, the, the fast growth startup law firms we, we're swapping notes and it's to be honest, the, the only difference in the journey is the fact that we're not, we don't need to be regulated. Yeah. We have exact, exactly the same concerns, cash flow, risk, staffing problems. So we bring all that sort of rounded knowledge to help our clients. And it's, it's sort of a peer-to-peer a -peer relationship, not a, you know, we're, there's no hierarchy in it. And that's a collaborative sort of um, approach to our consultancy. And that's got to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't work for us. And I always say, it's probably on every episode now, collaboration is domination. But I, I think that, that what I'm gleaming from the way that you approach and run your business is you're not a supplier, you're a partner. You know, yeah. you collaborate. And like you said, when you're helping them not just to do the doing, but from that commercial side of things and actually how that can position to help for future business, not only mitigate what might be the issue here and then. So I think that's really nice and, and, and really good for our people to understand that, you know, it's not just going out there and getting a supplier, but it comes back to really understanding the business and then wanting to partner with them and be a long term um, partner. OK, let's talk about RegTech. For people who may not know, what is it in very simple terms? And then what are some of the common challenges facing law firms regarding regulatory compliance yeah. particularly and how do you help them overcoming them so I'll use the way I consider rec tech because I'm sure there'll be experts out there who'll say oh that's not rec tech it's the whole <laughs> list thing well the when I talk about rec tech and when I'm talking to my clients about rec tech is it's the technology available to them to help with the help with their compliance with yeah. their regulation regulatory uh, obligations so that could be um, an electronic verification and ID tool there are, there are a number of okay. providers out there. To, to put that into layman's terms, uh, essentially when your uh, law firm's acquiring a new client, they might need to run ID checks and they might need to verify that identity. The software out there is phenomenal yeah. to give accurate and speedy results on that. Compare that to um, the old fashioned method of bring in your passport, Yeah, I'll certify the passport, yeah. or can you scan me over a copy of your of certified passport, and it's, that's very, very old fashioned now, it's sort of, it, you know, there's still a place for it, and depending on the demographics of the, the, the consumer, that, yeah. and say, say el the elderly clients sometimes still want to come, come in with the passport, they don't want to be doing, yeah. you know, video selfies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so that's one form of reg tech, but there's so many different, different, um, technology tools out there that support the compliance journey within law firms. Right. So that's that's what I mean. So you mentioned before, head of uh, risk at legal, yep. uh, that's LEGL. Um, so they are a reg tech company doing exactly that, but they've got, I mean, I won't give them justice um, to explain exactly everything that you can go and look at legal if you want to. Um, but essentially my role with legal was to, not the risk and compliance of their business, mm. but actually, from the perspective of they are servicing law firm clients, I know a lot about law firms. Yep. As and being a solicitor myself and having to use the technology, so it's more of a um, um, market insights consultancy to say, do you know what? This is these are real pain points for for solicitors, or um, or from the regulatory side, looking at the tech you need to cover um, this aspect of regulation. And, and from what I'm seeing there, it doesn't quite, you know, you, yeah. recommending enhancements to that. So our services that work very much like that with the reg tech companies. And the other aspect of it is we do provide content. Okay. So one of the methods that reg tech companies have for marketing and, and getting uh, brand credibility and, and trust of the market is to use experts to comment on relevant value add um, yeah. things and then um, publish that in forms of articles blogs and and that really is a, a key part of reg tech sort of marketing strategy so we can help that we work with a number of reg tech companies on in that way 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm fascinated by this area. And another area we're going to come on to, which I'm also uh, fascinated by, is crypto. Hey, listeners, we'll get back to the episode in just a moment. But first, we have an exciting update from our sponsor, Clio. Are you a solo practitioner or running a small law firm? Then you know how challenging it can be to stay on top of the latest trends and manage your practice effectively. That's where Clio's 2024 Solo and Small Firm Legal Trends Report comes in. This comprehensive report is packed with valuable insights into the current legal market, client expectations, and the newest technology shaping the future of legal practice. Whether you're looking to boost your firm's efficiency, improve client satisfaction, or grow your practice, this report has the data-driven strategies you need. And the best part is absolutely free. Don't miss out on this essential resource. Head over to Clio's website and download your copy of the 2024 Solo and Small Firm Legal Trends Report. Visit clio.com forward slash uk forward slash ltr to get your copy today stay ahead of the curve with clio the leader in legal practice management software now back to the show and talking of content you know an article i'm going to read it here off your website um new style scam alert warning states hive risk advises firms in relation to complex issues and advised where there is a crypto element including regulatory issues relating to anonymous parties and matters involving complex source of funds challenges bit of a mouthful so how is crypto becoming more prevalent in the legal sphere and what does it mean to be regulatorily compliant and that is a Big question. Yeah. So as you're reading the question, like, there's, so, there's like yeah. four articles I can write out that st- <laughs> statement. Yeah. So there's a number. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the sort of broad question first, and I'd like to dig into a little bit of the of, of some of the more specifics that you mentioned there. But where we've seen it typical, typically where crypto comes up when we're working with law firms, and this is typical, is on um, when the when the firm's dealing with a transaction for a client. Yeah. The client will say. Um, or, or when the, the solicitor asks, where are you getting the money from? They say, I, I raise it through crypto trading, for mm. example. And so many people now have crypto. It's sort yeah. of, it's not that sort of fringe technology that it used to be. And so the difficulty for a firm is to, to say, well, actually, are we comfortable? How do we know where that money's come from? Yeah. And it's on the source of funds inquiries that a lot of firms really do not have the risk appetite or Mm. the time or the inclination to figure out a safe path through it and there is a safe path through it um, but it requires some investment just to get the risk assessment right um, just the risk appetite right for the firm but typically the issue is because actually crypto is there's a there's actually a, an audit trail on what, as soon as it's on the blockchain, there's an audit trail yep. on what's gonna happen. So so often it's the money coming in, where, so when it's in fiat, when it's in pounds and pence, where did that money come from? To mm. then buy the first lot. Yep. Um, so often the, the inquiries are around where it came from first, not so much when it hits the, the crypto aspect. But what we do have, we have um, one of our consultants, uh, Tony Brown, is a crypto expert, and he can really delve into actually interrogating that that crypto wallet. Yeah. And also, he has his own risk assessment geared to um, crypto specifically. So we can help there. If a firm wants to say, do you know what, we want to start, our, our clients are insisting that we do this, then yeah. come and speak to us about that because we can we can sort of help you with your strategy. And, we, and for some firms, we've done that, and, and we've said ourselves, like, it's probably not worth you time to do it like you know but once you've you know once you've paid us to help you and also the risk and risk versus reward actually it's probably not for you and yeah. um, you mentioned anonymous crypto there yeah. and that's incredible I, i'm sure you won't mind me mentioning but will mckenzie from mckenzie costs instructed mm. us to support our, this was quite a few a couple of years ago now um he had a, a, a an instruction for a, an anonymous anonymous client Right. And uh, I won't say too much, but mm. other than what's in the press, because he's done a post about it and there's a judgment out there. But we, we sort of helped him say navigate from his perspective as a regulated person, where are the risks in acting for a unregulated, uh, sorry, a, a, an anonymous or a pseudo yeah. named party. And that was, in, I, I love that because there's no precedent for it. You, mm. It's research skills and you've got to think creatively to think actually how can I justify this on a sort of a compliance regulatory side when you kind of, it's completely new. Yeah. So that was fascinating and, and, and do look at, at Will McKenzie and he does some really interesting stuff. 
on costs. My head's just spinning about how to approach something like that. Like there's there's, there's a lot to yeah. unpack with that. That could be a whole podcast yeah. episode. You'll have to ask Will if you'll he'll show you my uh, my recommendations. But <laughs> I'm sure he will. I'm definitely I'm gonna. Yeah, check he's that a great so. guy actually to have on your show at some point. Okay, cool. Well, we will talk about other things that you're doing mm -hmm. because you're also the co-founder of Compliance for Law Firms, yes, which is point. a weekly forum for uh, discussions. So tell us a bit about the forum and some of the most recent topics of discussion, let's say over the course of 2020. Okay. So Compliance for Law Firms is a, an initiative set up around, it was over three years ago now, with my good friend mm -hmm. now and uh, colleague Steve Brett from yep. E3 Compliance Training. And it's about three years ago, we were just chatting about yes, as you do collaborative ideas like why don't we do a discussion forum for law firms and yeah should we run it every Wednesday at 12 <laughs> yeah every Wednesday We're like well it sounds a bit ambitious that three years on more than every single Wednesday apart from Christmas and if it clashes with the cold Coca conference Steve and I are there at 12 and we've grown this incredibly strong group of risk and compliance professionals from law firms from your top 10 Yep. law firms in the UK to sole practitioners and everything in between this group of people that are passionate about compliance and suppliers also who are passionate about compliance and we come together every Wednesday to Chatham House Rule which means don't say who said what yeah, yeah. <laughs> so please yeah speak freely and then we open up we we have a topic every week different different topic and then we um we we have a an open forum it's it's, it's, it's usually online, it's predominantly online, but we've won four, run four in-person conferences now. In fact, the fourth one was yesterday. There we go. Yeah, which but is incredible. I, I love the consistency with that because I also have an initiative on a Wednesday. I have a, a newsletter that goes out every Wednesday. And it's amazing how quick Wednesday comes around. <laughs> you know, there's so much you need to plan and do. So I tip my hat off to you for what you're doing and the value you're giving and you're just creating spaces for people to come and get educated on important areas. Um, something I'm particularly excited about that's happening this year, um, which I'm delighted to be partnering with you on, is on the 3rd of July, we have the GBLO, which is the great big legal offsite, which is going to be here actually at Ribby Hall where we're recording today. Can you, t and actually our theme is Future Proof Success, the playbook for mid-market law firms. Would you mind sharing more details about what the event's all about and what's on the agenda? Yeah, sure. So it, again, this was a real collaborative process, wasn't it, when those those real creative ideas are, uh, are flowing. So what we wanted to create, we wanted to create that off-site, a really good off-site, a company off-site, but involving the legal community, mid-market law firms, bringing everyone together and creating that environment for collaboration and for progression. Yeah. So it's it's intended to be, well it is, it's actually booked and it's, the tickets are selling fast. Um, it's it's a, f a space for innovation essentially. So around about 200 people in the room. Um, we've got some incredible guest speakers. We've all already announced Pierce Linney yep. from Dragon's Den and uh, Implementer AI who is speaking with us. And we're going to be looking at the real key areas to help future proof um, the law firm. Yeah, and that's what excites me because I don't see this type of event, particularly up here in the north of, of, of the UK, providing that value, particularly for, like you said, that mid-market law firm. And I say Ribby Hall, if people aren't familiar with the location, I think it's a great place for an offsite. Like I said, we've chosen offsite. It's not a stuffy, another legal conference midweek that you've got to go to because your partners or people have said go to it. You'll come here and everyone will get value. And I think we're really focusing on the experience. Like you just walk through Ribby Hall, you see the lush grounds, see the spa hotel where people can stay um, like you say we've got peers we've got some amazing other sort of high profile industry bodies um, in and around the legal industry of course we're being supported by our friends at Clio who are obviously you know legal tech unicorn leaders in cloud-based technology they're going to be here so I do think this is really going to be one of the most pioneering events that year one is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so if this is already sounding exciting um, get excited and I guess with that where can people go and find uh, more and where can they grab a ticket? Where's the best place for them to go? Absolutely. So if you follow Rob or myself on LinkedIn, we're talking about it all the time. <laughs> um, so find us there. Um, but also, it's our Eventbrite tickets are on sale now. So if you type in Eventbrite, Great British. 
great big legal website. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great British bake off, um, but that's so much fun. Um, yeah, so on on Eventbrite, uh, the, there's early bird tickets available now. I don't know when this this is being recorded and sent out, so they might be over by the time this is done. <laughs> but essentially, the, it's good value in any event. Um, so yeah, definitely the Eventbrite page will be the place to go to snap those up. Yeah, and follow us on LinkedIn because we're going to be making lots of uh, announcements. And as I say, there's going to be a lot of entertainment as well. We've also thought about the entertainment piece. You know, there's going to be some quirky networking alternatives. It's just going to be an experience that I think will really set people apart in terms of just going to another legal event. And I think Ribby Hall is just the best location. So go and give it a Google now. Check it out because it's a fascinating venue. I walk my dog regularly around these grounds and it's just a beautiful place to, to have. It's also high for us HQ as well. So where we are now, we're actually c coming to you uh, live, pre-recorded. <laughs> Absolutely. From uh, from Ruby Hall, so this is this is our office at High Risk here, um, and we chose it actually not just because I'm a member of the health club here, <laughs> um, and the kids are here every weekend, but um, it is absolutely beautiful grounds. There's some really big corporations that have this as their venue for their yeah. annual conference, and I think that was it. Do you know what? If it's good enough for them, it's good yeah. enough for the GBLO. And I think one of the I used to do uh, procurement recruitment many years ago, and BA Systems used to be a huge client of ours, and they're huge over here. But just think of the engines and jets and work that they do. So they do lots of things here. So yeah, definitely check it out. Um, it's gonna be an exciting event and I'm really looking forward to it. But we need to talk about other things that you do because okay. you keep super busy. Okay, so you're passionate about educating the legal community, um, hosting webinars such as a masterclass in fraud, threats and vulnerabilities for law firms, uh, fraud risk in law firms and economic crime acts. Why are you so passionate about sharing your knowledge? Okay, well one, it's great for the profession. From our sort of giving back, it's good for the profession to be educated and, and actually do things in a safe way, in a compliant way. So that's sort of our giving back, but to be brutally candid with you, it wins us business. Um, yeah. Essentially, when we give in, when we put our content out, it's so much free stuff, and we don't just save the you know the high value stuff for our pay, you know for our paid service. We lead with our value so that our our potential clients are. They really know what they're talking about. So we put our best consultants on, we put our best foot forward in our free content. Um, so on our website, there's actually, you've mentioned the fraud web, the fraud webinar, but there's actually, there's a crypto webinar on there. There's, there's shake up your conveyancing department on there. There's literally, there's so much on there. Um, with the fraud, the fraud webinar particularly, the reason we chose that one, one, it's topical. Yeah. Um, two, we've got an incredible fraud team. Yeah. We've got Nina Dial, who was a, a, count, a, a director of, of fraud at Kios, which is top 50 firm. We've got Gavin Ball, who's our technical director, who's got an incredible um, track record in, in counter fraud, some massive clients he used to work for. And Peter Taylor, who's the, AKA the fraud guy, yeah. uh, who's an incredible, I mean, we've got the sort of the, I mean, we call them our high risk of, of, of Avengers, our, our, our team, and we've got that sort of super team. So we say, right, get, get these guys in a room, just talk. Yeah. And that's just so incredible as um, it is the, just like a supercharged advertisement for us. <laughs> like blatantly, we don't, we don't um, sell no. in our sessions. It's pure value. But when, when someone watches that, they're going, do you know what? We need those guys. I, I know I've always said um, not selling is selling. I think if you lead from value, like you say, and you provide content. And, you know, one of my mentors said to me, you know, content for free, implementation for a fee. You can provide the best content, but still they're going to want to use a trusted person or company to help with that implementation and make sure it's all seamless. So I absolutely agree with that approach. I love your thought leadership approach. And I guess we should talk about how we got connected, which is probably through the world of online and probably through that platform called LinkedIn um, and through our mutual friend as well, Graham. Um, so you're pretty active on social media and LinkedIn. Um, how are you using, and it's important, you know, and I, I advocate for people to do this and lawyers and law firms as well, but how are you using LinkedIn to build your personal brand as well as sort of the high risk brand? So it's it, it actually underpins my whole so of course there's different components to it but the, the success of my of this business or this enterprise that we've created is pretty much predominantly due on account of linkedin mm. and the visibility we've got there so when i set up i literally and i did have an old linkedin account which was you remember in the old days and it was yeah. basically having your cv online and maybe you were connected with a few previous colleagues or current co colleagues so i ditched that and set up a whole brand new linkedin account from literally when I when I switched into risk and compliance, and I built brick by brick 
I've got about nine and a half thousand connections now or followers, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, and it was literally just right, okay, if I'm building a business in this space, who do I want to see my who who yeah. would who need who do I need in my network? And it was literally add, 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 yeah. add, 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 to start from somewhere. And then I started putting my message out there. So the I mentioned before the um the GDPR lectures, so I put a little uh, uh, you know, a little video out back in 2018. Mm. And hello, it's so cute. I'll have to dig out that little yeah. video. Um, but in fact, and it's the connections that you make and your network that you build. And now, in fact, the 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 gentleman who helped me with the high risk logo and hi, Sage, if you if you are watching, um, he found me from that GDPR video. And this this <laughs> this is what's so important. And I try to educate people on that. It's Billion users, largest professional networking site on the planet. It is a virtual networking conference at 24 seven, working without you, getting your profile right, people are gonna visit. But then if you put good things out there, you never know how far the tentacles will reach. And like you've given a great example there of how you can be discovered. Mm -hmm. And you've built a phenomenal brand, you know, you've built a non phenomenal business, you know, you're one of the fastest growing in the space that you are. Um, keep it up. So no doubt people will be inspired listening to this today. No doubt people are going to want to want to know more. But my, my sort of final question is, you know, what can advice can you give to those who might be interested in going into a career in strategy, marketing, and regulatory compliance? What would be your sort of words of wisdom? I think those are three. Those are actually three potentially three niches, and I kind yeah. of bring it all together, <laughs> uh, which is uh, yeah. So you can do it that way. Uh, I think to do it the way I've done, you've got to do it for the love of doing it. Do it for the journey. Don't do it for the quick wins. You might not yeah. get paid for years, and in fact, it's going to cost you a lot of money to even before you've even got one client. Yeah. And you've got to take a lot of rejection. And the and the times I've I've stood up to talk and just your mind's gone blank and it's yeah. bombed and you think, why do I keep putting myself through this? So you've got to have that tenacity. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just not going to make it because it's tough. Yeah. Um, taking that aside, so stripping that back a bit, if you want a career in regulatory law, you don't have to do all this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do this. So you can literally build yourself up even if you can get an even an admin role in a law firm and then you just show a little bit of a shine to risk and compliance or regulator just show because no one wants to do it yeah. so literally no one wants to do it so do a little bit of homework you might have to do it in your own you probably will because no one will probably pay you to sit there and you read it when you're like you're supposed to be just sorting the mail yeah uh, post yeah my kids watch too much american youtube <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah so you can actually if you show a little bit of um initiative for that you're going to move very quickly up into being that go-to person on risk and compliance because literally no one wants to do it and yeah. that's why consultancies like mine do so well because the skill set isn't often there and they're looking for those you know those those are those um ambitious no, ambitious and annoyed, enthusiastic compliance professionals. But one of the th key things I would give advice to um, any youngsters, or yeah, I, I say young in terms of experience as well, not just, just age, um, is be careful on the firm you choose to go into compliance with. Mm. What we see sometimes is uh, new, newly qualified solicitors who get uh, recruited by um, sort of a uh, startup. Mm. ABS type, not lawyer owned. I'm going to really offend some people now, mm -hmm. but I've seen it. And that solicitor is just there to be the practice, practicing certificate. Mm. And they're being asked, and the power is not with them. And they're being asked to do some really crazy things that they don't, and they, and I have seen them um, sort of crumble before yeah. me. And I'm not just talking one. So if you're watching that and you think I'm talking about you, I've seen plenty, I've seen yeah. a few. Um, so I'd say just be really careful about the firm and have your senses out. Is, is this right? Is this does this feel professional? And if at any point you feel uncomfortable, move. Yeah, I think that's true. And also, you know, at that level as well, you know, newly qualified lawyers still quite a lot to be to, to be learning. So there's quite a lot of pressure there in any event at the start of your career. I mean, this has been invaluable, Kate. I've really enjoyed learning more about your career journey, high risk, and what you're getting up to. So if our listeners want to know more, where can they? reach out, what are the best websites, social media handles for yourself and Hive Risk, and we'll also make sure we share them with this episode for you too. Definitely LinkedIn. Although you might start on following me because I'm quite active, <laughs> but that's fine, I don't mind. Um, but yeah, so LinkedIn, Kate Burt, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Also HiveRisk.com. Um, so we, we bought the hybrid, we bought the dot com and we we're very excited than that. We did have dot co dot uk, um, a bit more expensive. But um, yeah, find us on 
on our website and there's so much free stuff on there and it shows you all about our, our services but also I've lost count of the number of awesome videos that are on there that you can just watch. Yeah, and something like this, you know. This yeah, is, <laughs> this we'll is put this on, we'll yeah. put a link to that one, you can watch this. In fact, you might be watching this from the website. Yeah, this yeah. is true, they might just go through that. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Kate. It's been an absolute pleasure finally getting you on the Legally Speaking podcast, wishing you lots of continued success with your own career, high risk and future pursuits, and of course, looking forward to the GBLO with you later this year. But for now, from all of us, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.